Rod, you, you had mentioned one thing in, in your comments about uh, some patients just really feeling better when they get rid of, of some of the tumor bulk. Uh, it, it is true, though, that there are some systemic agents, we just alluded to some, that can have a fairly dramatic impact on uh, at least some of the symptoms of hormone hypersecretion. Uh, those are, are, are commonly, commonly used. Do you put most of your patients on somatostatin analogs up front for symptom control in addition to surgery, or how would you, how would you view yeah. that? Well, we, you know, operating on neurotic and tumor patients is a very different business because they can have crises on the operating table. And uh, we're publishing a large series of about 100 cases. Uh, and we found that a lot of the things that were assumed about this were actually incorrect. Um, the general incidence of this is considered to be about 7%. We found it was really 30%. It's considered to only be a risk for patients who are having overt clinical syndromes. We found that there was no difference in the frequency. So we make sure all the patients are on drugs, uh, somatostatin analogs, before we operate. Uh, we also want to get a, a view of the cadence of the disease. It is not rewarding for anyone for us to go in and debulk the liver and then find out that we have a, d a disease that is just moving along at a rapid pace. So there is a period usually of observation to make sure that we, we do have uh, a more favorable type tumor. And um, if we get all the disease out and the patient has no syndrome after the operation, uh, we have no data that says continuing them on a somatostatin analog at that point has any benefit. We can't really impute the PROMID data for unresectable disease on that group. So I tell patients, if there's a time in your life where you don't want to be having a shot every 28 days, this would be it. Uh, other patients feel uncomfortable with that and want to continue, and we have to decide that on a case-by-case -case basis. You alluded to a study called the PROMID study. Uh, which I believe was the first randomized study to suggest that somatostatin analogs may not only help with symptoms of hormone hypersecretion, uh, but may also have a cytostatic effect and, and help control uh, tumor growth. Let me turn to, to James. With that, with that data, should all of our carcinoid patients be on somatostatin analogs now? <laughs> That's a really good question. Uh, you know, the PROMID data was done in patients with uh, small bowel carcinoids, essentially mid gut carcinoid tumor. And they include appendiceal as well. And for the, these non-functional tumors that were previously untreated, uh, the studies you know, showed that the treatment was octreotide LAR, delayed time to progression in, the, in these patients. Uh, while the study did not really show a survival benefit, it really wasn't adequately large to demonstrate one, so it doesn't really exclude there is a survival benefit. So for me, uh, it's all about weighing risk and benefit. You know, what's the risk for these patients with advanced small bowel carcinoid tumors, and what's the potential benefit? Because the favorable side effect profile, I think I put most of my mid gut carcinoid tumors, whether they're functional or not, I would consider using a SMS analog uh, in those patients. Uh, and we actually had some other data just presented at this meeting, that, which is kind of interesting. I think this is one area that uh, community physician probably could do a little bit better. Uh, we did a study where we looked at the SEER Medicare database and looked at the patient who have a diagnosis of carcinoid syndrome. So, you know, flushing, diarrhea, clear indications. Uh, but there appears to be, you know, a large number of patients who do not get treated uh, with, with uh, SMS analogs. So, the analysis showed that the patient who did not get treatment with mass analog and uh, had flushing diarrhea, carcinoid syndrome, distant metastatic disease, uh, had inferior survival compared to those people who did receive treatment. Uh, this this was you know in the advanced population, actually in the there in the local regional population as Rod alluded, there you know whether you used it or not seems to make no difference. So some of these patients can do or quite well, or, or perhaps the better statement would be maybe on somatostatin analogs for a, a prolonged period of time. Let me turn to, to Pam. These, these drugs, somatostatin analogs, are, they're not completely without side effects, are they? That's right. <laughs> so, um, you know, I tell my patients first and foremost, they're literally a pain in the, in the rear to get the injections. <laughs> um, and beyond that, there are other side effects. So gallstones, sledging, bradycardia, patients can actually have some diarrhea on, on these. So I think that I, I totally agree. I think that I wouldn't, um, you know, I have some surgical colleagues that actually put all their post-operative patients on somatostatin analogs. I'm trying to teach them not to, but, um, you know, I think that to be selective about the patients that we're 
putting on those. So just to be clear, if, if they have no evidence of disease, there's, there's really no role to right. put these people on somatous analogs for the rest of their life. Right. Correct. So in the sort of adjuvant setting, there is no role. And longer term, you mentioned some of the potential side effects. Something that comes up from a surgical standpoint is cholecystectomy. Uh, you recommend that in all the patients that are undergoing an operation? Not all. Um, I think we have to make an assessment of what is the likelihood that the patient is going to need long-term somatostatin analog therapy. So certainly when we're in there and we have metastatic disease, uh, or we're doing a liver resection on a patient with metastatic disease, the, you know, the potential for long-term somatostatin is great. And so we recommend taking out the gallbladder anytime we're in the abdomen of any of those patients. Uh, if I'm doing uh, a right hemicolectomy for an appendiceal carcinoid tumor, the potential for metastatic disease is quite low. And so we actually may do more harm by removing all those gallbladders and causing an occasional bile duct injury that needn't be. So we do not do it in those circumstances.